It is the Anti-Defamation League. It is American Jewish Committee. It is the Joint Distribution Committee. It is human rights, non-governmental organizations all over the world that are also our eyes and ears. And we consult with them very, very regularly. So our monitoring apparatus is in place. And I kind of get it, if you know what I mean. We're supposed to pry, we're supposed to ask the questions, and then we're supposed to report. But the second verb in my title, combating, is the bigger challenge, I believe. What did we learn from Stella's experience? What did we learn from all of our relatives coming out of the ashes of Auschwitz? What did we learn individually and what did the world learn? That has to move us to put more emphasis on the combat, on the fighting, on not just having conferences where we talk to each other and wring our hands about terrible things happening. We have to move to action. And we have to figure out strategies to address different things that are happening around the world. And that is my challenge. I have certain tools in my toolbox to do this. As a diplomat, I have diplomacy. That means I can have one-on-one -on -one meetings with countries, and we're engaged in multi multilateral organizations. Of course, you know the United Nations. There's also the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, which has um, put a lot of attention on anti-Semitism and uh, human rights abuses in Europe and beyond. We have the Organization of American States, where we deal with what's going on in Latin America. So in addition to one-on-ones with countries, we work in this multilateral um, organizations to try and educate people, to try and move them to our position, because you know often we are the lone voice. We, the United States, is the one no vote, is the one voice when it comes to the disproportionate attention that the Jewish people read that Israel gets in multilateral organizations. <clears throat> in the last six years, for example, we have found that if you add up all of the resolutions in the United Nations that have criticized a specific country, Israel has been criticized 170 times. Now to put that into perspective, the Sudan committing genocide as we sit here has been named in five resolutions. In the Human Rights Council, which the United States just joined, and we joined because we believe in engagement and we're trying to work with other countries to get the Human Rights Council, the official voice in the United Nations for human rights, we're trying to get it to be what its mandate is. The Human Rights Council also passes resolutions. It just finished about two weeks ago, and in its three-week session, it had five re resolutions condemning Israel's um, human rights abuses with one no vote, the United States. Most of those resolutions happen every time. Why? Because on the Human Rights Council, there is a permanent agenda item. It's called number seven, and it's human rights abuses by Israel about the Palestinians. No other country is named on the agenda. No other um, country is supposed to be named. But Israel is single out. Fifty resolutions have been passed criticizing Israeli human rights abuses, more than all of the others combined. And there have, of the 13 ses special sessions that have been called to examine human rights, 50% of them have been about Israel. <coughs> And so each time we vote no, we make public statements that are on the record and publicized internationally that say, not only are we voting no, but we object to agenda item seven, and we object to the special sessions that are being called for Israel only, and we call for Israel to be 
um, vetted and examined through the same human rights lens as every other country. Right now, we're working behind the scenes on trying to make sure as new, new um, countries come to the human rights agenda that Iran not be one of them. They are lobbying to be part of the Human Rights Council, which in the theater of the absurd is ultra absurd. So we work in diplomacy, and that's where I really learned the importance of baby steps. We work in advancing civil discourse. What is happening in the world verbally, rhetorically, and in um, government bodies is um, sometimes we couldn't make this stuff up. And we are using the power we have as the superpower and as having a vibrant democracy where we encourage non-governmental organizations to speak out. We are trying to support with our resources and our um, diplomatic support organizations who dissent with governments that are repressive, organizations that um, support human rights and report on human rights violations, and we are trying to create, in addition to vibrant democracies, robust non-governmental um, organizations that will make sure that countries are doing the right thing as we support those that do it here. And in addition to the diplomacy and advancing um, civil discourse, we believe in building strong relations. When my father came out of the Holocaust, he made it his business as a rabbi. He was ordained at the Breslau Seminary in Germany. He was a rabbi when he was um, rented up. And he came to this country, and they used to call him an ecumaniac because he spent all so much of his time reaching out to other religions. His best friend was Monsignor Corkin on the south side of Chicago. He totally was about using interfaith outreach, interfaith dialogue, interethnic groups, um, and intergroup groups to build relationships that if you look at someone and you get to know them, you can't hate them. The American Jewish Committee did a survey last year where they asked um, a lot of students um, about their views about Jews. In Spain, 50% of the students said that they didn't want to sit next to a Jew in class or in the lunchroom. Follow-up question, do you know any Jews? No. So we like in the State Department, person-to-person -person exchanges. We support visiting, um, we have a visitors program that brings over tens of thousands of professionals all across the spectrum. <coughs> Come to this country, they are in at least three cities and they're housed in um, people's homes. And we have found that many of the people who come from the Middle East and imams that are placed particularly in Western Europe, that when they come here and they're staying in a Jewish home, or they're staying in a home and brought on a tour of a community, and they see the vibrant, um, if it was here in New Haven, they would see the vibrant federation, the vibrant community relations arm, the Hillel students, they would see your institute and they'd say, this is not a dying remnant. This is a vibrant community that's, that has multi-issues on its agenda, that work with other religions and other community leaders to alleviate poverty, to build understanding. These aren't people who are demonized in their local media. And we have found many of them to be transformed. Does it translate into their Friday night sermons in their mosques? We don't know. But again, it's baby step. It's, rela it's relationship building. I come from a community relations background. As you are here with the Jewish Community Relations Council of New Haven, I worked with you when I was the director of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. I am by my nature a community relations professional. I believe in reaching out. And the State Department knew what they were getting when I walked in the door. And so I spend a great deal of my time reaching out to 
interfaith advocates and different religions, different ethnic leaders, and as I travel around the world, I do my what I'm supposed to do, which is make my diplomatic visits to governmental offices. I go and I meet with the Jewish community. I want to know what, what's going on in their minds, what's going on in their communities, what are their needs, what are their concerns. And I always also meet with non-governmental organizations that are working on interfaith issues, promoting tolerance. By the way, I hate the word tolerance. I don't mind the word intolerance. I think that says a lot more. But in Diplo speak, the word tolerance is used. And so promoting tolerance, I, I go to these communities and I meet with leaders who are working together. Jews, Christians, Muslim, Baha'i, Zoroastrians, it can be, it depends where they are, working together to promote democracy, to promote accountability and tolerance. That's where, that's what I do when I'm going around. I leave in a few days to go to Ukraine, Lithuania, and Tunisia. My itinerary includes meeting with the Jewish community. I love that everywhere I go, there has never been one chief rabbi. There's always two or three chief rabbis. It says something about our people. And so I meet with all the chief rabbis separately, and I meet with the community, um, sometimes different factions separately, and I meet with non-governmental organizations. And they teach me so much. I find out what they're most concerned about. I find out about what they're doing and what they're not being permitted to do or what they need help doing. And I'm collecting excellent examples, or as we say in government, best practices, to share with the rest of the world on how we think investing resources and energy in cooperative reaching out can help. We always face this tension of the particular and the universal. It is Yom HaShoah. It is a day to remember a particular thing. Never before has there been a genocide planned, made legal, law by law, that included death factories. It deserves particular attention. It deserves particular honor and it deserves particularly ex examination on how human beings could get that low. On the other hand, intolerance is intolerance and hate is hate. And there is a universal to this. And so part of my job is to always emphasize the particular, emphasize specifically what is happening to the Jewish community. But the combating part of my job, and if I want it to be impactful, I have to also make the universal message that hate speech is unacceptable. These resolutions that condemn Jews, unacceptable. And that we have to work together. My dream in the next year or two is that every time there is an anti-Semitic incident that we are speaking out on, I get Farah Pandit, who is my equivalent in the State Department for Muslim Outreach, to have her condemn it. And if a law is being passed that is um, flying in the face of the human rights of Muslims, that I'm the one that condemns it. That when Egypt is um, abusing cops, then I'm the one that condemns it, and it doesn't have to be a Christian minister. That there's a recognition that sometimes the message is the most important thing to get out, and sometimes the messenger can amplify that message. And finally, it's not just the right thing to do, it is enlightened self-interest that we build those kind of bridges. After all, it is the way we Jews in the United States have been safe, secure, 
and frankly successful. I had a meeting with um, an interfaith group in London a few weeks ago. And it was this great discussion we were having about anti-Semitism. But one of the imams of the largest um, mosque had said nothing. And the facilitator of this interfaith conversation said to the imam, do you have anything to say? And the imam said, I don't know why we're talking about anti-Semitism. People don't hate the Jews. They own all the banks. They run the media. They completely control the United States government, and pretty soon they're, gonna, they're going to control the United Kingdom. And I said, listen to you. Listen to what you just said. And he said, I am merely stating fact. Well, I realized I wasn't going like, to revolutionize his life by telling me, I don't know what books you're reading. <laughs> But I did say, what percentage of the U.S. population do you think is Jewish? You know what his answer was? 80. He said, I think 80%. And I said, well, with all due respect, on a good day, we're just under 2%. He said, no, that's not true. You're lying to me. And I said, you know, I'm in this very uncomfortable position right now. Because a huge part of me does not want to disabuse you of the power you think I have. <laughs> I rather like you thinking that I can snap my fingers and make anything happen. But guess what? It's not true. He muttered. But another Muslim imam from a different mosque, much lower in the hierarchy in London, said, I rather admire that about you. Jews have figured out that you need to build relationships, that you need to be respected by the opinion leaders, by the editorial writers of the New York Times. They love the New York Times, they love to take on the New York Times. When they've got pretty good press in, in England. And I rather admire that you have elected congressmen and senators. We need to learn from you how to do that. And I said, you're never going to learn from us how to do that if you hate us. And he said, you're absolutely right. So community relations has its place. Building those relationships, learning how to use diplomacy. I had in my prepared remarks, which I have not used for a second here, um, I had some examples I wanted to tell you. Just to show you that what Stella went through is still happening to some Jews. Whether it's in Venezuela, where a synagogue is firebombed and the community wants to meet with me, but not in Venezuela, could I meet them in Miami? They're that scared to congregate. Or we have um, in Moldova, where in, at Hanukkah time, while you and I were in Jerusalem at the Global Conference, an incident happened in Moldova where a, a city permit allowed uh, on public land for a menorah to be erected. But an uh, Orthodox priest and his congregation stormed, led a protest, took the menorah, broke it into pieces, and brought it to, the, to a monument of a nationalist uh, Moldovan. Um, because no one was physically hurt, it wasn't considered a hate crime, and he was find the absolute limit of the law, which was $50. A well-respected Orthodox priest and his congregation did that. So it's not just crazies. And I can't be here and not mention what's going on with Iran. Now, I just have to say, we all know of the crazy comments that a crazy man who heads that country, Ahmadinejad, says that he wants to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, that he is trying to develop the nuclear bombs to facilitate that, and he believes the Holocaust never happened, and has held conferences and cartoon contests to emphasize this. When I talk to many people around the country, 
They use the words I just used with me. Oh, he's just a crazy man. Oh, he just says crazy things. This is an interdisciplinary institute to study anti-Semitism. Crazy people have come to power saying crazy things. Mein Kampf was the best-seller, best-selling book. It beat the Bible in 1933. It laid out exactly what he was going to do. We have in Egypt today, it completely controls the television that's in Egypt. And if they say other, they're not telling you the truth. And we saw bone-chilling videos that go on on Egyptian television and on Al Jazeera, which is watched by a huge percentage of the Muslim world, which shows clerics it's worse than Holocaust denial of Ahmadinejad. This is Holocaust glorification, where they show actual footage of the concentration camps, of bodies being thrown into pits, of Jews begging for their lives as they're being herded into gas chambers. And the cleric looks at the camera and says, isn't it wonderful to see their humiliation? Allah willing, next time we can have another Holocaust and it will be by us believers. We can say it's crazy, we can say they're extremists, and that puts them somehow in our minds out of mainstream and out of respectable thinking. This is government-sponsored television. Ahmadinejad is the head of an extremely large country about to develop a nuclear bomb. If we don't take comments of anti-Semitism, strategies of anti-Semitism, and threats to white Jews off the face of the earth, then we truly have learned nothing from Stella, from my dad, from all the people you know that have survived or have survivors in their families. These must be taken seriously. I have the very good fortune of working for a government that is taking it seriously and has given me the opportunity to voice these concerns together with the strategies and toolbox I've been given at the State Department and advocates and concerned people like you. I really believe it will not be in our lifetime, but it may be in this century, that we relegate anti-Semitism to old history books. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Rosenthal. And um, I'm going to speak briefly for about 10 minutes, and I, I don't know how I can follow these two uh, speeches and, and individuals. It's really a wonder that you're both here. Thank you both for your speeches. Um, so, as Ambassador Rosenthal said, I, I hope that there'll be a day soon in this year that we should both be unemployed and there'll be one day for uh, studying or working on anti Semitism and maybe some obscure history department will deal with it uh, soon. What I'm speaking about is the morality of, uh, of memory uh, in, in the face of contemporary anti-Semitism. And before I, I start my speech, I would like to acknowledge Professor Hartman, who's here, who uh, has written much on these issues and has uh, worked on the archives here at the University and so much, so I'm honored that you're here today, and also part of ESA. I'm going to speak very briefly, and then if it's okay, we can have questions uh, for our two guests. I want to stress that in the memory of the Holocaust, that we have to understand that anti-Semitism has changed. The world has changed, and anti-Semitism has changed along with it. And the fact is that we're not going to see brown shirts marching down the streets of Europe or in North America anytime soon. This is not the anti-Semitism that we have to be concerned about. This is the anti-Semitism of history, which we should know and understand and learn and apply it for today. Anti-Semitism, and I'm going to speak in very broad strokes, entered different phases. When the world saw religion, when, the, when religion was a dominant way of seeing reality and understanding the world, the Jews were the wrong religion. And the belief was if only the Jews would change, 
the world would be a better place, the Messiah would come, the world would be saved. When the world viewed reality through notions of biology and ethnicity and race and racism, the Jews were suddenly perceived and constructed as the wrong race. And people believed that if only the Jews would leave or be eliminated, that the world would be saved. And we enter a phase today where the dominant way of understanding and seeing anti-Semitism is through the state of Israel. That Israel has become the Jew among nations. And people believe if only Israel would disappear, or if only the settlements would be frozen, if only the government would fall into line and follow certain peace <coughs> projects, that not only would the world be saved, the Middle East will be saved, radical Islam will disappear, and, and we would be living in a glorious reality. And of course, this is not the truth. The key thing of anti-Semitism, what the different phases of anti-Semitism share is this not only genocidal aspect, that anti-Semitism is genocidal, it's also this belief that the world will be saved if the Jews change or if they're eliminated. I, did a, a, I published an article, did a study with Professor Edward Kaplan, a colleague here at Yale University, and we looked at classical forms of anti-Semitism, the old uh, types of anti-Semitism that Jews uh, are cheaters in business, that they stick together, all the sort of classical forms of anti-Semitism. And we interviewed 500 people in 10 European countries for 5,000 uh, respondents to this article, which is published in the Journal of Conflict Resolution. And what we discovered is that at levels of anti-Semitism, classical notions of anti-Semitism, are pretty stable in 10 European countries. We then asked people, we created a category of what we called Israel bashing, not anti-Zionism, of course, you could be critical of Israel and Israeli policies. Of course, you could be an anti-nationalist, not believe in nation states, and criticize Israel or other countries for existing, and that's fine. That's not anti-Semitism in our view. We looked in our, in our study what we call Israel bashing, that the Israeli defense forces are purposely killing children, that the Israelis are poisoning water, uh, wells, Palestinian water, things like this, very extreme pronouncement of Israeli policies. And what we discovered was startling. The level of anti-Israel or Israel bashing in the European countries is relatively low. But of the population, where the average population is between 6 and 8% uh, categorized as anti-Semitic, and only about 4 or 5% are considered Israel bashers, of the Israel bashers, 56% of the Israel bashers are also classically anti-Semitic. So the Israel bashers are 13 times more anti-Semitic than the average population, roughly, of these 10 European countries. So, people who are extraordinarily critical of Israel, you can be assured that the majority of them are anti-Semitic. And in terms of mathematical modelings and equations, these are numbers that are off the charts. If you go to a pharmacy, for example, and a product was 56% more likely to cause cancer, you could be sure that it would be removed from the, from the shelves immediately. So, the, the dehumanization, the demonization of Israel, the double standards, as, as Ambassador Rosenthal was speaking at the United Nations, these are all things that are very much connected to issues of anti-Semitism. Last year, I was in Geneva <coughs> doing a two review uh, conference, and uh, Ahmadinejad came to the United Nations, he spoke in the General Assembly, and it was on Yom HaShoah, it was a year ago today, on Yom HaShoah, in the General Assembly of an institution that was created from the ashes of the Holocaust. Literally. And Ahmadinejad was the only head of state to come to this conference. The only head of state to come, and he came to speak to the world. He had a world platform to speak about how the Jews were dominating the world. He spoke in the narrative, literally, of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in the General Assembly at the United Nations, on Yom HaShoah. And Today, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in places like Turkey, throughout many Middle Eastern countries, is now the second most published book after the Quran. Turkey is turning out, they have 12 publishing houses turning this stuff out. It's now not the rantings and ravings of the fringe, it's now into mainstream music and culture and film and television. Uh, in, in Jordan, throughout the West, Iran 
is not only building a bomb, and they are building a bomb to wipe Israel off the map, and they are doing it. They also are the exporters of genocidal uh, anti-Semitism and an ideology of the most pathetic forms of anti-Semitism. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, as you know, is the most pernicious form of European anti-Semitism. It's based on a forgery in the late 1800s from France and Russia. We know the story. But it's amazing that an Islamist, political Islamic social movement is using the most pernicious forms of European culture, of European history, to rid the Middle East, the world, of the Jews from the region. And they're exporting this to places like Venezuela and South Africa. The deputy foreign minister of, uh, in South Africa got a 10-minute standing ovation at a stadium in front of 18,000 people at a soccer stadium when she spoke about how the Jews control America, lifted from the protocols. This ideology is spreading quickly. And I would even venture to argue, we should do a study on this one day, that more dangerous than Iran's nuclear weapons program, and I hope the Obama administration will confront them eventually and soon, even more dangerous potentially than this weapons system is this disease of anti-Semitism which is beginning to have traction, which is in <coughs> it's the elephant in the room at the United Nations. It's entering into Western European discourse, intellectual institutions, university institutions, in, into, into the media, and it's coming to North America, it's coming to Canada, and it's coming to the United States. That this has to be not tolerated at all. We need to understand the ideology of Iran. When, when Ahmadinejad came to Columbia University and he said that there were no gay people in Iran and everybody laughed, including faculty and students at one of the best Middle East Studies departments in the country, when people laughed at him, they don't understand the ideology of Iran. When Ahmadinejad said there were no gay people in Iran, he meant it. Because if you're gay in Iran, you're killed. They subjugate women. They, they, they don't tolerate religious pluralism. They put Baha'i people in prison. And they are literally calling for the extermination of Jews. This is based on an ideology. This is not the rantings and ravings of a few individual. This is the core of a social movement. It's the core, I'll repeat it again, it's the core of the social movement. In 79, during the revolution, when the revolution of Iran came to power, Ayatollah Khomeini, in the first pages of his most important book, where his disciples learn from, they speak about the Jews and they speak about Israel as, as a cancer, as a bacteria in the Middle East that needs to be eliminated. This is core to religious belief and ideology, and we need to understand that the ideology and the symbols and the religion of the social movement is very important. This is not the rantings of ravings of a few people, and we need to understand how, through the protocols, these images are affecting not only the Middle East, but now the West. Elie Wiesel came to Yale University, it's now over a year and a half ago, and he spoke at the law school, if you remember, as part of the Chubb Lecture Series. And Elie Wiesel, I grew up uh, meeting him or listening to him in Montreal. He had family in Montreal and he used to come regularly to speak. And Elie Wiesel to me sort of has the humility and wisdom of uh, the great rabbinical tradition. He sort of encompasses it or he has it. He has that thing that you can't really uh, describe. Not only does he have that, this wisdom and humility, but he's also been a human rights activist in South Africa and Cambodia and Sarajevo. He's been in all of these uh, issues speaking loudly and speaking clearly. And Elie Wiesel spoke about the possibility of another genocide against six million Jews. And for me to see Elie Wiesel, the survivor, the, the, the symbol, a, a powerful symbol of, of survival, for me to see Elie Wiesel speak about this in his lifetime, to see that in the lifetimes of other survivors who went through this atrocity, this, this unimaginable, indescribable history that we a piece of today, that they have to, in their lifetime, speak about the possibility of another genocide, to me, was one of the most pathetic and indignant things I've seen in my life. Elie Wiesel, in his lecture at Yale, went on to say that the thing that really bothers him, as if that wasn't enough, was the silence of the students, and the silence of the intellectuals and the scholars, and the silence of our world leaders. That's what really disturbed him. 
And two years later, it's unbelievable that two years later, we have here two people from Stock the Bomb in Germany who've worked tirelessly trying to raise awareness. Other people, Ambassador Rosenthal and others have been working, you know, we don't sleep at night trying to ring the alarm bells and trying to wake up people. And for some reason, we are met with silence. I don't often agree with Benjamin Netanyahu, but I want to read a statement that he said in the Yad Shem yesterday for Yom Hashoah. The historic failure of free societies to confront the Nazi beast was that they did not face it in time. He said at Yom Hashem. And today we are witnessing the old hatred of Jews once again fueled by extremist Islamic authorities led by Iran and their satellites. Iran's leadership is racing to develop a nuclear weapon that, and declares its intentions to destroy Israel. The world is gradually accepting Iran's extermination declarations regarding Israel and we still do not see the international determination required to stop the, the arming of Iran. But if we learn something from the Holocaust, it is that we cannot remain quiet or flinch from the face of evil. And this is the, the situation today. Iran, in a sense, you have to respect them because they're open, they're honest, they're straightforward, their military policies, their strategic policies, their sermons, their teachings, they are straight up, open, honest, in the media, they tell President Obama and the Western leaders exactly what they think. And we should respect them for their integrity at that level. But it's we in the West. Where are the students today? Hillel Slivka sponsors this event, and look at us here today. Where are the professors and the faculty? Where are the leaders of our community? Where, where is the outcry? And what are we doing about it, ultimately? In Judaism, the ethics teach us that we're judged by our actions and our inactions. This is how we're judged. Martin Luther King said eloquently, and I won't say it as eloquently as he did, that he's not disturbed by the actions of the few bad people. What really concerns them is the inaction of the vast majority of good people. And that, that is the lesson that we, we need to learn. We also have to remember that in 1942, the world knew about the Holocaust. The world knew, Roosevelt knew. And, and the Americans didn't take in enough refugees. Even, I dare say, Jewish leaders of the American Jewish community were afraid to take shtetl-speaking, Yiddish-speaking Jews to upset the balance in, in, in the society. And they weren't so well-spoken to bring in refugees. The same in my, my country, Canada, Canada had the worst record in the Western world for taking in refugees. The famous, none is too many, was uh, uttered by the Minister of Immigration at the Avian Conference in, in, in Europe, in France. Uh, the, 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 the returning of the passengers from St. Louis back to their death in Nazi-occupied Europe. So the question, and I guess my appeal to the community here, to the community in New Haven, to the community of scholars, is what are we doing? If not now, when? Thank you. So we have some time if you would like to ask a distinguished guest some questions. We have time for a few comments. So Neil, Neil Professor Neil Preston. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on um, your very last point. You made it very clear that you thought that the, um, even though he's a, a madman, we can't ignore him and that something serious has to be done. Now, what I'm wondering is the um, approach that you outlined, you called many times for small steps, for, um, you said your instincts refer to community organizing, towards um, what one of the main things, one of the things that seemed very good was trying to keep your mind off of the Human Rights Council. Um, but the, the general approach of the Obama administration seems to be towards engagement 
is where it's assembly of a coalition of, of perhaps to administer sanctions. This has all been moving very, very slowly. And I'm just wondering if you feel that given the, um, the potential danger posed by Iran, that um, it's going to be enough. And whether what will happen in effect is that they will end up with a, um, um, with a bomb and that we will end up effectively having done nothing and that the efforts, the small steps, will end up being a cover for not having taken necessary larger steps. Well, let me just start by responding that, can you hear me? Yeah. That um, I am a special envoy on anti-Semitism and George Mitchell is the special envoy on the Middle East situation. And so I don't, I mean, there isn't a bright line when it comes to Jewish hatred on these two subjects, but he deals with the politics of the Middle East in a different, in a different way than I do. Now having said that, I don't think it's at all fair for you to say the United States isn't doing anything. While we're sitting here, the largest conference ever gathered is in Washington. As a matter of fact, I'm nervous about going home, how I'm going to get back to my apartment, because the city's closed down. 46 or 47 countries are coming, and the goal of this is to change the discussion about um, nuclear bombs from deterrence and therefore acceptable so that we don't have a nuclear war, which I grew up with, to the danger is rogue countries and rogue organizations given. And therefore we have to deal with security of elements that can, can make nuclear bombs. Uh, this is unprecedented. What will come of it? We won't know until tomorrow at closing. But I think it uh, reflects a change in strategy and a reality in the, of the world a reality that it's, we're not worried about Russia having more bombs than we do. We are worried about rogue governments like Iran or Al-Qaeda, a rogue organization with satellites all over, getting their hands on it. And that is the strategy that, like Iran's transparency in what they say, so has the United States. Now, having said that, there are back-channel conversations going on all over the place and all, all the time. <clears throat> some of which I'm privy to, some of which I'm not. Uh, much of which you're not. You know, just that's the name of the game. That's why it's called Back Channels. But discussions are going, this is so high on the agenda, I can't begin to tell you how often on my classified drive this is what the discussion is. It is not being ignored. It is not being responded with silence. It is very serious. And how to get the world to um, to cooperate and um, deal with a rogue country that people are willing to sell arms and, and parts of nuclear bombs to is the challenge. And um, it is through engagement that is in the newspaper and it's engagement through back channels that this is the top priority of the United States government. The gentleman in the back. Um, hi. Um, so Looking around, it seems like I'm probably the only undergrad in the room, and I think a lot of points about the class and not most people, but also I think that it points to um, a generational gap that I've witnessed that I find quite scary um, here as well. And uh, so, I guess a few years ago when I was talking with my grandmother, she said, you know, I support these stages really because I think without it, I told that to someone here, and you know, I think I'm sort of like a nutcase when, when I say it, so it's that seem to be. And I think that most people here um, you know, deal with the issue of anti-Semitism quite lightly, um, like Holocaust jokes. You can tell, and you don't have much risk of you know, someone questioning you. And I think it's something peculiar to anti-Semitism. You don't see you know, people making slavery jokes. You shouldn't see this sort of thing. But you know, Holocaust jokes are much more common. Um, and so when I ask people about this, and, and usually most people don't, but I'll ask people, so why do you think they say this? And you know, it's that thing you talked about where, you know, well, Jews are powerful, Jews are successful, like, you know, anti-Semitism is really that serious of a threat. And it's, you know, I'm always kind of in a position where I'm, I'm struggling to figure out how to respond to that because it's true if you look at, you know, like cinema, there are so many Jewish 
actors and directors or politics, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of Jews involved in the Obama administration or, you know, all these different places, um, there's a lot of Jewish involvement. So I just want to tell you would respond to this, um, you know, Jews are successful and the Senate is not that big of a problem. Well, you want to, did you want to have a generational divide. I mean, part of it is we are seeing a crisis. We are in a country where we have had organizations saying the sky is falling for the last four years. And so differentiating a real crisis from a, from a not so real crisis has been a problem and with policy leaders and um, policy makers. Um, how much of this is real, they ask. Our reports show it's real. Um, the generational divide I'm very concerned about as well. I think there is a Holocaust fatigue. <coughs> Some of it is, with all due respect, my father's been gone um, over 30 years, the only survivor in our family. Stella is still young and doing well, but many of the survivors are in a generation that will not be around for decades to come. And so there has been a sense of urgency by filmmakers, by diary writers, by um, projects to uh, record real life stories. And so you have seen a lot of focus on the Holocaust. And I think some of the fatigue is because it's been out there a lot. And some is because it is directing Jewish identity through a negative uh, experience. When we look at the investments we've made as an organized Jewish community, the Federation can speak to this well, as can your Community Relations Council, but the investments in our young have been birthright Israel, have been an increase in Jewish day schools, has been um, very much to it, um, have Jewish youth have an experience uh, and identify their Jewish identity with something very positive, as opposed to anti-Semitism. And, you know, I think we can walk and chew gum. I think we can multitask, we Jews. And I think we can honor and teach the history that has not, the world has not resolved the anti-Semitism that gave us the Holocaust. And we can instill positive um, identifications of Jewish identity to, to the young um, at the same time. It is not an either or reality. There is another thing that happened. And I don't think we can be, um, I don't think we can be comprehensive and understanding now without recognizing the impact 9-11 had on our country. What it meant to human rights, what it meant to um, backlash, and what it meant to the Muslim population. And so the left, frankly, which I consider myself firmly planted within, the left writers, the left thinkers, many on college campuses, as a result of 9-11, became very aware and very concerned about human rights abuses in our own country to Muslims. All the reports we show, whether it's a Pew study, whether it's an Anti-Defamation League poll, whether it's an American Jewish Committee poll, the best indicator of anti-Semitism when they ask questions is it is total correlation with anti-Muslims. And so instead of viewing it's either Islamophobic or it's anti-Semitic, I believe um, we have let that dichotomy happen, and Jews have gotten the wrong end of the stick on it, because the worry about the human rights abuses in our country towards Muslims 
and the um, lack of good community relations reaching out, combining Muslims and Jews, I think has fed this. And so you find uh, my daughters, not quite as young as you, but close, um, will tell me about what is being discussed and how, you know, if we're talking about victim studies, it's going to be about um, abuses to Muslims. And it, instead of incorporating it with anti-Semitism because hate is hate, and religions have a huge, uh, they have some introspection to do about hating Jews and hating other religions including Muslims need to self-reflect, as do Jews, as do Christians. I think we have made a, a mistake, and we let our human, our community relations apparatuses around the, the country go rusty. And now we're seeing this incredible spike in anti-Semitism, and the world's so surprised. It could have been totally predicted. Also, if I may, if I also can start to when I was sitting in Vienna, I informed of the synagogue, and I saw Jews scream. It hurt me a lot. But when we had, I went back to the hotel, and I spoke how I feel about Austria. I said, how come there is still a Jew scream? Because many, many years ago, there was a woman emperor, Maria Theresa, and she hated the Jewish people. So she made a ghetto and named the street Jew Street. How come it's still here? That should be better off and put a Holocaust monument and, and the names of Jewish people, survivors. So that wouldn't give me an answer. I said, it has, has to be changed. They shouldn't leave it like this. I was very outspoken and I didn't get an answer. So if I, if I may address the question, I think it's a very important question, and being here at Yale for the last uh, four years or so. Yes, still, I'm the same. Sorry, How stop. come I don't get the answer? How about the grandparents? I ask the students, how your grandparents, didn't they tell you what was going on? They never said anything. I didn't get an answer. Thank you. This is a generation. So, that is. I think I'm on internet speed. <laughs> Twitter, I have to say something. Um, to, to your question, I think it's a very important question. Being at Yale for the last four years, I'm amazed that the the silence of the student population on this issue, it, it's, I find it staggering. I know growing up in Montreal in the 80s and being on a university campus, it was very different. And uh, I'm not completely sure why it is. I don't, know, I don't know if people are comfortable, they don't want to be put into socially awkward positions, because I think to deal with anti-Semitism in the current climate is very difficult. You're labeled as a neocon, you're labeled as a fascist, you're labeled as a Zionist, an apologist for Israel. It's not easy, and if you don't have the education or background to speak out is not easy if you're living on campus and you want to fit in and have a good social life. I think that's a part of it. But I think we're also living in a culture of appeasement, to be blunt. You know, just to lay it out there. Anti-Semitism begins with Jews and never ends with Jews. We know this from history. The radical Islamist movement, not Islam and not Muslims, but radical political Islam, wants to exterminate Jews. They can't tolerate the self-determination of the other on Islamic land in any condition. This, they're clear. 
So Israel without the territories, Israel with just Tel Aviv, it's just not acceptable for the other to control Islamic land. Jews are the only others that have self-determination or is perceived as Islamic land. So there's no uh, appeasing these people. The radical Islamic social movement is homophobic, it's sexist, it does away with religious pluralism, it's opposed to democracy, it wants to create societies based on different levels of citizenship and different legal codes and systems for different people. It's diametrically opposed to what everybody in this room stands for and believes in. Whether you're Republican, Democrat, American, foreigner, wherever we're from, I'm sure we all believe in this room that democracy and citizenship and equality is something that we could strive for. And the fact that students are not here uh, and they're not speaking out on these issues is, is really disturbing and troubling for the elite students, one of them, you know, the cream of the crop, the most educated kids in the country, to not be really engaged in this issue, to me, is terrifying. When I speak, I'll just be brief, the first question I ask when I go to audiences, to, to synagogues, to local communities, to, to students, I ask them, my first question is, how many people have read the Hamas Charter? How many people have read a fatwa? And time and time again, the average answer is between 1 and 3% of the audience. And I remember going to free Soviet Jewry rallies with my grandparents and their friends, my parents and their friends, and my sister and her friends and my friends. We went to Montreal, tens of thousands of people from the small community screaming to let my people go. We knew what the laws were in the Soviet Union. We knew the names of the families. We knew who was in prison, who was underground. If you went onto university campus in the 1980s and 90s and asked people what was apartheid, who was Mandela, what, who's, which American or North American companies are interested in South Africa, we all know the basics. Everybody knows. You ask kids today, students today, what is a fatwa, what does the Hamas charter say about killing Jews? People don't read. And if you don't know, you can't even have a debate. Naming the victim, and 
often in liberal thought, this goes by, I won't go into the details, but very often in liberal philosophy and liberal thought, and it's translated into political action, we end up blaming victims for the crime. So if African Americans live in ghettos, they're lazy, right? If, if a woman is raped, she was asking for it. There's a whole history of blaming the victim. And I, I'm not a defender of the settlements, but to think that all of the actions of the Israeli government or of the Jews is responsible for anti-Semitism, it's, it's American. I'm, I'm not saying you're saying that. I, I'm, 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 saying, I'm not saying you're saying that. She's making an explanation of why she thinks that. So I'm saying that this is a very problematic uh, philosophical perspective. I'm not a defender of the settlements, I believe the only way for there to be peace in the Middle East is a two-state solution. Exactly. But I also believe that people have agency and that we shouldn't blame the victims of anti-Semitism for its creation. That this is a misreading of anti-Semitism in a profound way. And there are people in the United States, some policymakers and advisors, such as Mr. Brzezinski and others, who have this equation. That, that, and, and I find this extraordinarily problematic and dangerous. Well, you, said, you said that um, they found out that the Israeli bashers are people that are anti-Semitic? They're 56% more likely to be anti-Semitic. Okay, but what came first? The anti-Semitic is the Israeli bashers. I think if you're... There was anti-Semitism long before. Long before. You said that it's increased now, the anti-Semitism. I think that's to do with the whole thing. Okay. One more, another one. I don't have any data to show that. I can tell you that he was elected in 2008 and, and by 70% of the Jewish vote, uh, by some accountings far more, 79%. Um, he enjoys popular support uh, among Jews. And yes, he has a lot of Jews around him and in important positions. I think the spike in, in the anti-Semitism was very clearly related to the Gaza December into January, December away to, into January on.